How do you get a 240-metre, 100,000-tonne oil tanker like this safely into port? Well, you do it with one of these, one of the world's most powerful harbour tugs. While giant ships like tankers may be the glory boys of today's industrious high seas, it's the smaller working boats packed with raw power that do the pulling, patrolling, surveying and rescuing that make it all possible. Forget about ships. When it comes to life at sea, it's the working boats that pack in the power, speed and technology. But which of them is the pick of the bunch? Man has always been busy on the high seas, be it fishing, fighting, trading, traveling or simply having fun. But none of this would be possible without a range of vessels ensuring safe... Hang on. I think someone's in trouble. Listen. Help! Mayday, mayday, mayday. I have lost a man overboard and I need assistance. Lifeboats, characterized by brute strength and a refusal to sink in the angriest of seas, lifeboats like this save 8,000 people a year in British waters alone. But it wasn't always like this. When the lifeboat service began in 1824, all they had was a 36-foot rowing boat. Not only did the lifeboat men have to face horrific seas, they had to power their boat through the massive waves themselves. Even with 12 strong men behind the oars, it would have been incredibly difficult and time-consuming to battle through rough seas just to get a mile out. Little wonder that, until the introduction of powered lifeboats in the 1890s, hundreds of people lost their lives in British waters every year. But with the help of steam, then petrol and diesel engines, lifeboats changed completely. Now they could get far out to sea, fast. But stranded sailors and the men and women whose job it is to rescue them have never had it as good as they do today. I give you the all-weather Trent-class lifeboat. Take it away, guys. The Trent class just powers into the action. No seas or weather will stop her from venturing out to save your life. With a top speed of 25 knots and a range of 250 miles, she can rescue an incredible 100 people at a time. And the key to all this performance is a combination of power and structural strength. This is a tough vessel. Tackling terrible sea conditions is all about squeezing as much power as you can into as light and as small a boat as possible. And the Trent-class lifeboat certainly squeezes in that power. Two V10 840 horsepower turbo diesel engines powering two propellers, to be precise, one each. Now, the designers really had their work cut out because to fit these two engines in, one of them had to be mounted facing a stern and the other had to be mounted facing ahead. I've got to get my hands on the throttle of these. Power. Ah. She's as good as she promises. As far as emergency response vehicles go, this one's pretty responsive. But all that power would be useless without a massively strong hull. At speed, a lifeboat hits waves every few seconds, subjecting her hull to the same force as a double-decker bus falling off a two-storey building. The boat has to be very strong, without putting on extra weight, which could slow her down. So she has a brilliantly clever space-age hull. It's four inches thick, yet weighs next to nothing, and is reinforced with a weird material called Kevlar. And this is Kevlar. Now, it may look a bit flimsy, but underwater, once it's mixed with a resin, it's 20 times stronger than steel. Just to give you an idea of how strong it is, they make bulletproof vests out of it. Even if the lifeboat's hit full-on by a giant ship it's trying to rescue, 
it's still very hard to sink her. Throughout are bulkheads sealed with watertight doors, isolating any damage from the rest of the boat. But even massive power and a space-age hull won't stop you being rolled over by freak waves. And over the years, many brave lifeboatmen have lost their lives. Waves aren't a problem for the Trent class, though. Did you ever have one of these, a weeble? Remember how they wobbled but never fell down? Lifeboats are designed in much the same way, with all the heaviest components, like engine and transmission, mounted as low as possible. This produces a low centre of gravity, which, combined with a large buoyant volume in the wheelhouse, means that the boat is inherently unstable when it's upside down. So, if a massive wave does capsize the lifeboat, it'll right itself in seconds. Brilliant! Not only is this boat fast and nigh on indestructible, it also bristles with state-of-the-art computer technology for tracking down the people it's trying to rescue. What you do is you enter an area and pattern of search into this plotter, in this case parallel lines, then that information is transferred via a satellite-powered global positioning system into an autopilot unit. The autopilot steers the boat, allowing the crew to concentrate on keeping a lookout. And to get a really good view, they can take control on the upper deck, several meters above the tossing waves. The Trent-class lifeboat uses massive power, a space-age hull, and state-of-the-art navigation equipment to save more lives at sea than ever before. She's the best friend that every sailor hopes never to need. She can take pretty much anything the sea has to throw at her. Or can she? Taxi! Some of the things lurking amongst the waves can even defeat a lifeboat. We're talking about the sneakiest and most dangerous of them all. Mines. Aha! Uh -huh. Meet Pap. She's an RCMDV, a remote control mine disposal vehicle. And that over there is her mum, a Royal Navy Sandown class mine countermeasure vessel. The armed forces love their snappy abbreviations. Meter for meter, the Sandown class is one of the most expensive warships ever built. She's all about precision and high technology designed to detect and destroy a deadly array of mines. Some newly laid, some lingering in the sea since World War II. So, how do mines work? Well, mines are either bottom-mounted, sitting silently on the bottom like this, or they float while tethered to the seabed. Now, mines can be triggered in a number of ways. The old type are contact triggered, meaning the target vessel physically has to touch them. But modern mines are much more sophisticated. Some can detect the magnetic signatures generated by the steel hull of a passing ship. This triggers a switch in the mine, and the mine goes off. We can demonstrate this with our plastic boat with two magnets in the bottom and the needle of our compass is the switch in the mine. Here we go. And that's why this mine hunter is one of the largest warships ever built out of glass reinforced plastic. Not only does this give her a reduced magnetic signature to prevent her triggering mines, it also makes her tough enough to withstand the shock from explosions. Some modern mines can be triggered off by the sound of a passing ship. An underwater microphone, known as a hydrophone, picks up the waves emanating from the hull of the passing vessel. The microphones can even recognize the sounds from specific target vessels and only detonate when these go past. But the Sandown has this problem covered too, by being able to switch from her diesels to quieter running electric engines when mines are detected nearby. 
But it's the amazing agility of this vessel that separates her from the pack. To avoid unforeseen mines or to maintain a precise position whilst deactivating them, she's got the twisting and turning ability of a small speedboat. Let me show you. Let's start off with the emergency stop. She can do a 180 degree turn. But why stop at 180 when you can do the full 360? Incredible. 52 metres long, 580 tonnes, and you can chuck her about like a small sports car. Brilliant. So, how does the Sandown manage to pull all that off? Well, the answer lies in her sophisticated propulsion units. At the rear of the Sandown are two Voith Schneider propulsion units, similar to the one we're looking at now. Nothing like regular propellers that point backwards. These whisk-like blades suspended from the bottom of the hull allow thrust of any magnitude to be generated in any direction. So not only do they propel the boat, they also steer it as well. Well, now we've seen how the Sandown class protects herself from the threat posed by mines. How does she remove that threat for the rest of the seafaring world that don't have these sophisticated defences? The traditional way of neutralising mines is to cut the tether and then quite literally sweep them away to a controlled environment to be destroyed. Hence the term minesweeper. But the Sandown class is not a minesweeper. She's a mine hunter and works in a far more focused way. Standing in the main mine hunting ops room is a bit like being next to a giant computer game console. Although when you play Minesweeper here, the stakes are a little higher. The first task is to find your mine. The Sandown does this by dropping a sonar pod into the water beneath her. It produces sound waves which bounce off underwater objects and produce these images. There are four sonar screens in the ops room. There are two over there to search for the mine, to locate it. And there are two over here to classify it. Now the one on the right is an expanded view, basically, of the one on the left. And the mine itself is that orange dot there. The boat's ultra-accurate propulsion system comes into its own during the sonar scanning process, as the mine hunter needs to sit very still and not drift. So we've located the mine on the ship's sonar. At this stage of the equation, enter PAP, our little yellow submarine. She's got her own sonar, two cameras, black and white in colour, and some explosive. And we're going to send her down to take a better look. Well, she's in position. Off you go, Pappy. There are no Liverpudlian rock stars steering this electrically powered yellow submarine. She's controlled from the ops room on board the mine hunter. So Pap is in the water and I'm controlling her with this little joystick here. Mm, awesome. We do actually have a view of the mine. You can see it quite clearly. I'm going along the length of it now with Pap. A bit to the right, so there we go. And there is a real mine. Exciting. Fabulous. When you find a mine like this, you suddenly realize what horrible weapons they are, lurking down in the darkest depths. So, let's get rid of it. Fire the FTU. Yes, sir. I think we got it. Well, she certainly makes the sea a safer place, but is the Sandown class the toughest safety vessel with the toughest job? If you need to deal with something a bit bigger, something much bigger, something that if it ran aground would cause monumental damage, you need a completely different form of vessel. You need one of these, the world's most powerful tug. Some boats have massive power. Some have great precision. But this one needs both. The Hopeton, one of the world's biggest harbour tugs. 
which pushes and pulls the world's biggest ships. And we're on our way to meet one right now. That, over there, is a 240-metre-long tanker. It weighs 100,000 tonnes and takes several miles to turn or stop. No problem when you're cruising the open seas with nothing in your way. But moving her into the close confines of a port is a completely different ball game. And that's where the tug comes in. This tiny 43-metre boat doing for the giant tanker what it can't do for itself. Park. And how? By using her phenomenal power and agility. So just to see the amazing agility of the Hopeton here, we've got both rudder propellers pointed in that direction. Now I'm going to put the power on and we're going to spin round. Watch this. We can just feel the boat leaning over and uh, we're getting into that nice pirouette system. I'm now 60 on both engines. Although the Hopeton weighs nearly 2,000 tonnes, she's incredibly agile. There's no rudder as such, but the two ducted propellers do the steering. Incredible. I've got control of a 2,000 ton tug in the Firth of Forth, spinning merrily from now until eternity. And now to put that raw power and agility to the test. Let's park. We've come eight miles out into the Firth of Forth to meet this tanker, and the whole process of docking her starts now. The first thing we've got to do is attach ourselves to the tanker using this incredible rope. Look at it. A line snapping when you've got 100,000 tonnes of tanker attached to you could be disastrous. So these ropes are thicker than your arm and made of fantastically strong steelite. Right, we're all tied up. Let's motor. The tanker is still powering itself forward at seven knots. But now the tugs are attached, they are acting as the huge ship's steering and brakes and will control its docking. It's a little while before we reach the terminal, so let's take a look at some of the heavy-duty technology that makes the docking possible. What I'm trying to say is, wow. Two 236-litre Rolls-Royce turbo diesels developing 10,000 horsepower. That's the same as 100 Land Rovers and gives massive, massive pulling power. It's not just the engines that give the Hopeton its pushing and pulling grunt. Each three-metre propeller is housed in an open-ended cylinder, creating a suction effect. This vastly increases the amount of thrust that can be produced. It effectively means the tug is pushed and pulled through the water. It's all that thrust, coupled with a cleverly shaped hull that lets the tug literally grip the water, that makes the tug's pulling power so enormous. But just how enormous? Well, a tug's pulling power is measured in terms of the wonderfully named bollard pull. It's established by hitching a giant version of this spring pulley from the tug, in this case me, to a bollard fixed to the key, and then giving the tug a bit of welly. Here we go. One third power. Half power. Full power. 30 pounds. So, I can manage a bollard pull of a measly 30 pounds, or 0 0.013 tons. Back to reality, the Hopeton has a bollard pull of 124 tons, which is in fact a world record for a harbour tug. It's so powerful, they actually had difficulty finding a harbour wall strong enough to test it against. So really, tankers like this are pretty small fry. 
time for the Hopeton to put all that power into action. It's 2,000 tonnes pitted against the 100,000 tonnes of the tanker. Now all those amazing pulling power measurements are shown up here on the screen in the bridge where we're about to start the docking process. So there's the tanker and there's the terminal we're going to berth her onto. The two tugs are now spinning the tank around. It's a six minute process. Delmeni over there is pushing the bow of the tank around and on Hopeton here we're pulling the stern round and then when the tanker is completely all the way around both tugs will then push the tanker onto the berth um, about 150 meters of movement. You've heard of extreme ironing, well this is extreme parking. The two massive V16 diesel engines producing nearly 10,000 horsepower are manipulated by these two simple joysticks here. Quite incredible. Halfway round. Although the tanker's moving very slowly, its 100,000 ton weight gives it massive momentum and it's taking all the raw power of the tugs to control it. So the swing has now been arrested. Um, Hopeton is no longer pulling the tank around. The momentum created by Delmeni pushing the tanker's bow around has created enough swing and we're now pushing the tanker onto the berthing position. Getting into that space in the multi-story will never seem so tricky again. You're just coming into position now, pilot, and moving slowly ahead. There we go. That's you in position, pilot, and all stopped. This landing pilot push too far. And the jobs are good. 100,000 ton tanker, no brakes, and longer than 23 double-decker buses parked on a dock that's not much bigger than it is. And all thanks to the massive raw power of the tug, weighing 50 times less than the tanker. Quite brilliant.